Okay, uh, let's get started. So welcome everyone to uh, this Friday's uh, Lockheed Martin uh, Maryland Robotics Center seminar. Uh, as always, uh, thank you to Lockheed Martin for their continued support of the seminar series. Uh, our seminar speaker today is uh, Professor Chad Jenkins. Uh, he's a professor of computer science and engineering and the associate director of the Robotics Institute at the University of Michigan. Uh, his research uh, is focused on problems in interactive robotics and human-robot interaction uh, and things like mobile manipulation, robot perception, and uh, robot learning from demonstration. Uh, Professor Jenkins has won numerous awards. Uh, I'm not going to list all of them, but uh, some of the more prominent ones. He's won the Sloan Research Fellowship, uh, the PKS Award. Uh, he's won the Young Investigator Awards from ONR from Air Force Office of Scientific Research, from the National Science Foundation. Uh, he's a fellow of uh, uh, AAAS. Uh, on a more personal note, uh, I always look forward to reading papers from his group. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the folks in the audience were uh, students in my uh, graduate course last semester. And one of the papers that we covered was a recent paper from uh, Professor Jenkins' group. Uh, in fact, uh, this paper also won the Best Cognitive, uh, Best Cognitive Robotics Award uh, at ICRA uh, in 2020. And ICRA, uh, hopefully all of you know, is, is one of the premier uh, robotics conference. So I'm especially excited to welcome uh, Professor Jenkins to our seminar today and look forward to hearing what he has to say. Excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you, Pre Professor Toker Carr. Um, uh, and you know, and I really appreciate the the opportunity to come and speak to to all of my great colleagues here at uh, at, at the University of Maryland, and uh, you know, and and just people who I think are doing good in robotics. And so I I I, I really uh, I really value this opportunity and. Uh, and I, you know, and I also, I think I'm going to miss Professor Lynn. I think I have, I'd have a meeting with her tomorrow. So I, so I'll, I'll at least get to see her, but I know she's doing good work otherwise. And so, um, and so I'm, uh, I'm going to just talk a, a little bit of, uh, about, about some of the work that I'm doing uh, in, in, uh, in how we can pro the future for how we can program robots in a more fluent way. Uh, and then I'm going to go into some larger thoughts about uh, about the field of robotics and sort of where we're going. But uh, but as I do this, I'm going to spend uh, I'm going to spend my time down here in this corner. So hopefully you see me. My I don't share screen. My video is uh, is hopefully you see me on the spotlight. Uh, and uh, and so I'm just going to be down here in this corner while uh, while I show my slides right here. And so I'll just start off uh, just by. Um, by asking a, a question, uh, which is uh, which is what question do you think I get the most uh, when I'm when I'm just walking around campus? So you know, in my uh, in my my twenty or so years in robotics, what what question do people think I get the most? And and you can think about it. You can uh, you know you can I guess put in the Q and A or, or maybe some maybe something like that. Um, you know, uh, and so like so you know what what question do you think I get the most? I'm a, while you while you reflect on that, I'm going to take a sip of my water. Well, if you've uh, if you've seen some of my other talks, you'll know that the that the answer to this is is um, is are you with the football team? <laughs> uh, and so uh, you know, am I? You know, and and I, I realize as I give this talk, I'm I'm very American in my viewpoint. And so I mean the American football team, right? Uh, you know, not the not the guys playing soccer. Um, I'm not I'm not I'm very I'm neat, I'm not really good at either one of those, but uh, but uh, but for sure um, the answer to both is uh, is no, I'm not with the football team. Uh, and if, and and you have you ever if you've ever seen a Division One football player, you know that I'm not, I'm I'm big, but I'm not that big. And so one thing I did when I was in graduate school is I, I need you need something to get your mind off of all the stress that's in, that's involved with graduate school. So what I did was I played rugby. Uh, and so you can see me. I'm back in the in the um in the uh in the second line there. And so I'm I'm big enough to make the back row, but not the biggest guy in the back row. So. Um, and so if you think about like what's the second most question that I get when I'm when I'm on campus, you maybe have already thought about this or maybe say or, or it comes to mind. Uh, it, it's less so uh, these days now you see the gray hairs on my face, but uh, but oftentimes I get when will I graduate and uh, and I say uh, I say, well, you know, I've done that before. I'm I'm actually faculty in computer science. And what I do is I, I program autonomous robots. I don't necessarily build robots, uh, but I program them so that they are they are autonomous. And so we work with robots like this. And so this is the, the Willow Garage PR2. Um, and, uh, and the Willow Garage PR2 is, uh, is a mobile manipulation robot that can move around in space, uh, can do autonomous navigation, 
on uh, on on flat environments like home and office and like office environments. It's got arms so we can we can pick, you know pick things up and dexterous manipulate uh, those objects and a, a whole range of sensors uh, so that we can we can see what's uh, so the so the robot has a sense of what's going on. Um, and so really, you know, uh, when, when students see this, uh, we do, a, we actually do a lot of outreach. And so when students come to our lab, uh, and, and see these robots, they actually ask me, you know, uh, is this a real job <laughs> is being a roboticist, a uh, thing that you can, you can really do. And, and I, you know, and I say, I say, yeah, you know, this, even though I didn't think this was possible for me when I was a, uh, a high school student, you know, it really is. And I'm fortunate that I have this opportunity and more people can take that opportunity. We need more roboticists. We need more people versed in, com in computing and artificial intelligence, uh, and mechanical engineering. Um, and so that usually leads to a wide number of other questions that I might get, like, will robots take my job? Uh, are you making R2D2? You know, um, you know, um, uh, you know, can I work increasingly? I get, can I work in your lab? Um, but for this, for this, for this talk, I'd like to focus on just a few of these questions. Um, and so will robots take over the world? Uh, so where is my robot? And can your robot bring me a drink? And so I'm going to take, I'm going to go through each of these and uh, and then we'll we'll and, and that will uh, that'll be the format for the for the talk. Um, so let's start off with will you know will robots take over the the world? And um, and the answer is uh, is robots are not even close to smart enough to do it for to do that. Um, I personally don't believe that you'll have a general artificial intelligence that will be the Skynet that takes over the world because at the end of the day, we program these robots, we can tell them what to do. Usually, you know, the, the irresponsibility would be on us as people. Um, and that's why we do need a, a sense of a sense of responsibility, a sense of professional ethics. But, you know, but robots aren't that smart. We, we decide what, how to use them, how to deploy them. Um, and we can decide to make robots that will help humanity. Um, and I think that should be something that we think about as this technology is being for, being formed in its formational stage. This is the right time to think about uh, about the impact, the societal impact of our technology. Um, and so, one of the more more impactful things that I've uh, done, one of the things I'm most proud of in my career, is uh, is um, is uh, a, a TED talk that we did with uh, with our collaborator uh, Henry Evans. And so you can see this is the this is the the talk that we gave uh, a few years back. Um, and really, the, the the essence of that talk is that Henry, um, he who suffered a, a stroke a stroke like uh, attack when he was when he was about forty years old, um, he lost the ability to to move his body except for his head and a little bit of his of his thumb, uh, and you know he has, has some amount of control, but really you know uh, relies on others to do the the activities of daily living, uh, based you know to eat, hygiene, uh, just basic basic care, and so he relies on other people. Um, but, uh, but working with, uh, with Willow Garage and, and people at Georgia Tech, he was starting to use robotic technology to potentially, uh, live independently. And so this project was, I, I think it's close to, to 10 years old. And so they've made great advancements since then, but this was the, the beginning where, where Henry was able to, to start to consume a meal on his own, uh, using, uh, using robot, using, uh, through robotics, uh, be able to, uh, to, um, to scratch an itch, to shave himself, and the way he did this was using uh, using the fa the faculties he had to control uh, to use a web page uh, to control uh, control the robot, so we can make nice flexible interfaces uh, they can he can use that are accessible to him that he can use in order to uh, in order to use in, in order to use robots so he can take care of himself. Uh, working towards that. And I think this is a great goal for us to have. Being able to help our aging and, and disabled populations uh, could be, you know, could be both uh, a huge, um, Im greatly improve the quality of life of many people in our society and also address some of the costs because it does take a lot of money that comes from our future generations uh, to be able to provide care for aging and disabled populations. Um, and what made a lot of this happen for, uh, you know, a lot un un underneath the engine of this was, uh, was a project that I've been involved with called Robot Web Tools. Uh, Robot Web Tools was, was the central aim of it, the central core of it, is to provide TCP TCP IP-like interoperability for robotics. So the same protocols that we use to, to that make the internet and all of our devices uh, work and seamlessly is something we should also have for robotics. 
And so we've developed a protocol called Rossbridge, which is just a very simple client server messaging protocol um, that really is meant to provide just plug and play interoperability uh, across mostly uh, for systems that use the robot operating system, ROS, but also interconnectivity with lightweight communication and marshalling framework. Uh, it could be used with, with YARP, a uh, uh, number of other uh, robot middleware systems, as well as other any, any other sort of interface, web and cloud systems. It can be used, uh, one of the more the more uh, more prolific cases to use MATLAB to connect to uh, to, to robots, um, but also just any type of system uh, that you can think of, and just you know, so you don't have to worry about the the compile and runtime behavior of your of your system. You just write modules and you plug them in, and it has this nice ecosystem that can make robots more accessible. And um, and so building off of robot web tools, when I was when I spent my year at Willow Garage, um, uh, Kaijen, who who was there, basically said. Uh, you know, Henry, you know, you're doing all this robot web tool stuff that we're using. Maybe we could, uh, Henry would like to fly some drones and maybe we could do that. And I was like, sure, no problem. So I zipped by the, by the Palo Alto mall and, uh, and I bought an AR drone and I just, you know, in a, in a, uh, in an afternoon, I just whipped up, uh, uh just a quick, uh, a quick front end, a quick, uh, uh, um, user web interface that Henry could use nice big buttons and nice big display that he could use for, for, um, for, for just, uh, for just controlling a drone. And then I took it up to his, uh, I took it up to his house and, uh, and, and it was just really amazing. So this is him. This is, uh, the drone and sort of highlighted in red there. And that's Henry from his, uh, from his, uh, from his window, uh, just being able to control this drone and, uh, and, uh, and be able to just move around on, on his own. Um, and so it was just, uh, I, you know, seeing Henry's face being able to move around independently in that way, I think it was just, it was just amazing. And he just flew this drone all over the place. He went on top of the solar panels uh, of his, of his, uh, of his house. Cause he'd never been able to see the solar panels that they put on top of his house. Um, uh, he, uh, he, he, they have a, uh, he tried to dunk a basketball. Basketball is too heavy, but he, but uh, we tried to try to fly it on top of his basketball hoop. Um, you know, he, he has a garden where they're growing lots of interesting things. And so, you know, it, you know, it's not really easy to get inside of a garden when you're in a, in a wheelchair and you have to have somebody that push you, your caretaker push you around, but through a drone, he was, he was just much more aggressive than I was. And I thought this was, it, it gave us some thoughts about how we can make uh, robotics can make the world more accessible for people. Um, and this is just one of many different applications that we've seen of using uh, robot web tools and, and Ross, the Rossbridge protocol uh, to, to, make rope, to make a wide variety of, of robot interfaces and use them in a wide variety of ways. And this is what we need to do to sort of bridge the front end and the back end of robotics together to put the, to actually put, you know, the, the divide between let's sort of mainstream robotics and, and human robot interaction. I think we need more projects like this uh, for it to come together. So we have a great, so we have a positive impact uh, and a substantial impact on our society. Uh, and when I talk about this project, people say, oh, wow, that, you know, students and various people say, you know, it's awesome and cool and it's expiring. Uh, they may make some sort of pop culture reference like, oh, that's like this thing I saw, you know, that's, uh, you know, uh, that I saw in Silicon Valley on HBO or, or I saw some other science fiction thing, um, you know, um, and so like, and, and so, uh, so we tend to that this is a good sort of starting point for having uh, various discussions. Um, but usually comes back to one question, which is, uh, so where is my robot? I see all of these people see all of these, uh, these, these, uh, these popular, popular stories about robots doing this and robots doing that. And, uh, and they see, um, they see a number of things about how, uh, how robots could, you know, could, you know, there's all these robots that are, that are in use, but, but where is my robot? Where is that? Where is, uh, you know, how is this actually going to get to actual people? And, uh, and when people say that, I say, you know, your robot, it's actually here. If you think about it, you know, uh, we have drones, we have, we have autonomous cars increasingly on the road. Uh, I still believe robot telepresence, especially in the pan post-pandemic is gonna have a big impact. You know, robots are manufacturing things. Uh, there are lots of different, uh, different robots that are out in use right now. But when people say robot, what they actually mean are mobile manipulation robots. Robots that can do things with people um, in, uh, in in normal human environments, and you know, sort of have like a you know have like a, a human like uh, um, 
embodiment to them, right? That, you know, that you can sort of see as sort of a, as, as, a, as a partner that can move around in space and dexterously manipulate things. Um, and so when we're thinking about these types of mobile manipulation robots, in fact, people oftentimes use Rosie the robot from the Jetsons. You know, this is as, you know, that's, that's the model that they have in their mind. How do we make that a reality? Um, but, and I would also say that, that these robots are available if you, uh, if you want to get one right now. Um, the question is, how much is it going to cost you? So, uh, so I would, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take a sip of my water and, and I would just ask people, how much do you think these robots, uh, how much do you think these robots cost? So the, there's a fetch robot. That's the, that was my first purchase when I got to the University of Michigan in 2015 on a PR2 right here. How much do you think they cost? I'm going to take a quick, quick, uh, a quick sip here. I'm sure Pratap, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you know, but uh, but I'm going to give it a second. Yeah, folks, uh, you can type it out in the chat box or in yeah. the Q&A box. All right. Oh, there we go. We have our, our first guess. Uh, 50,000. A lot of people like 50,000. 10K, 30K. I love these guesses. You know, I, I, my, one of my favorite shows is The Price is Right. And so you should think of it as trying to get as close as possible without going over. Um, there we go. Was that 250,000 USD? All right, those are some good guesses. 100K, there we go. I love these guesses. I'm gonna, I, will, I will move us along and say, and say uh, that these robots, if we, if we actually thought about it as plotted over time, uh, so time is time is sitting behind my head right here. Uh, so time on the horizontal axis, cost on the vertical. Uh, the PR2 came out in, in 2009. It was about $400,000, which is more than most people's houses. Um, and so, uh, but when I bought my fetch uh, in 2015, uh, it was uh, it was about $100,000, um, which is you know a more much more affordable in robot terms, but still a lot of money. If I compare this to the first robot, humanoid robot that I worked with, uh, which was the NASA Robonaut at Johnson Space Center, um, that was about a million and a half dollars. And so, uh, and you know, and so what we're seeing is, uh, is you know, if we go back to linear algebra and do our uh, you know, use least squares to 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 fit our favorite order polynomial to this data, um, you know, we could get a curve that looks like this. Uh, and when I originally made these slides in 2017, the projection was that your robot would show up last year. Uh, for about forty thousand dollars, and uh, and that's sort of what we're what we're seeing. There are robots out out that sort of take on this uh, that sort of fit into this uh, this around forty thousand dollars that are mobile manipulation platforms. Um, and so uh, you know, so if you look at uh, at Hello Robot or uh, I think there's a TR1 out there, you're starting the if you look at our Franca arms that you can put on a mobile base, you know, they're starting to get to this forty thousand thousand dollar level. And and this also goes with the economies of scale. I believe with the NASA Robonaut, they build about about three to five of these NASA Robonauts. Um, you know, at, at that 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 cost. Um, you know, uh, the PR2 they built about 60 of those at, at a you know that where where you're able to make more of these uh, at a lower cost. Fetches, uh, you know, I don't know how many fetches are out there. My guess is hundreds, um, and so the cost gets lower. And I, as we start to develop more applications, and the cost and the numbers that we numbers of robots that we produce goes up, the cost will go down. Such similar to how uh, how the cost of computing went down uh, with greater numbers. But this is only really talking about the. Uh, talking about the, the, the physical platform, but what about the, the control of this? How, you know, the autonomy that runs on the system. And so if we think about when I was a graduate student, uh, that's me as a graduate student shaking the Robonaut's hand, um, you know, uh, that was, you know, that everything was mostly done through teleoperation or remote control. And so really I'm just changing my body for exchanging it for the robot's body, but I'm still the one who has to do all the cognitive work. Um, what we've seen over the last, over the last uh, 20 years or so is with the, the rise of laser range finding, RGBD sensing, um, that we've been able to, 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 to develop autonomous navigation uh, that can allow us to pick something up at one location uh, and take it to another location. So, you know, going from point A to point B, we can do that uh, relatively, you know, relatively well. Um, and that, that's just sort of your, you know, that's, we, can, we can call that sort of put that there, put this thing in location A, location A and go put it there in location B. Um, but that really is just doing one action at a time. 
how do we you know start to start to build up so the robot can do a task for me so i don't have to say you know prescribe all the individual actions for the robot to do something i just say here's the outcome that i want i would like breakfast made or I'd like my coffee made, you know, please go fix the water heater. Uh, can you assemble this furniture for me or go, uh, or go build the, build the, uh, you know, build this, this, um, you know, build, build the, the playground set for my kids. And, you know, and so like, so I can just start to delegate tasks and expect an outcome. And so when we think about this, this is really about how we can get robots to do a task for me. Um, when we when we say robot do a task for me, what we're really asking is, can we can we make the world programmable? The same way that uh, that computers um, uh, computers have made uh, digital information automatable, programmable. Um, can we robotics is really asking, can we do that same quest? Can we do that same ability to make things uh, automatable and programmable, but do it for the real world? And uh, and so um, and so really, that's like you know. You know, what do we have to do to, to make our world programmable? Um, and traditionally, this is, you know, we've we sort of thought about, you know, distant environments as, as challenging, but, uh, but if you don't have to really look any further than your own kitchen, your own home environment to see, to see how difficult this problem can be. Um, just in, in, a, in an average home, there might be, you know, thousands of different types of, of items uh, with each having their own form and function, their own, the, the semantics associated with each of these objects. Uh, you know, we don't, we, we don't, we haven't, we haven't really um, got a handle on, on the, all the actions that are afforded to these, to these different types of objects. Even we're starting to be able to perceive more of these objects with the rise of convolutional neural networks, but being able to do that at a level of, um, a level of re reliability that we would trust these systems is still is still uh, is still a challenge. Um, and so even just being able to cook a meal, you understand like you know the there are certain things that you would do with a pan, uh, how you pick it up, how where you should place it, what happens when you turn on the 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 gas light to you know and how it heats up. What do you what should a robot do with a container? What should a robot do with a sink? All of these things are very challenging, um, and so, so you know, so you don't really have to go beyond your house, your home environment, to see, uh, to see, to um, to experience, uh, to see, to see where where the frontiers of robotics uh, need to need to that that the frontiers of robotics need to address. Um, and really, if we want to think about when I think about this from the perspective of of somebody who does human robot interaction, uh, really the the goal is is that for to be able to be given an arbitrary robot and be able to have a software stack that allows us to perform an arbit arbitrary task in an arbitrary environment. And if we have a general software stack that allows us to do this, then we can, we can have the sort of uh, heterogeneity that we've, that we've come to love with, uh, with digital computing environments. Um, you know, I don't have to rewrite, uh, you know, um, I don't have to, to rewrite my, um, my my a lot of my libraries I can cross compile them they work on a wide variety of uh, if in a, for I can cross compile in a in a, in a uh, high level high level programming language that works on many different platforms um, you know and and it works in a many for many different it can work for many different tasks or purposes how do we get that for for robotics and traditionally this this problem is described as uh, as learning from demonstration so how can I teach a robot something it learns from that demonstration and then can extrapolate to new domains. And when I think about what learning from demonstration is, I go back, you know, my literature review of this goes back to the, to the MIT AI lab back in the 70s. Uh, Patrick Winston uh, led a, uh, had a group that, uh, that essentially was trying to show, to say, how can we demonstrate something uh, in a scene, uh, you know, demonstrate a scene to a robot, uh, use computer vision or the computer vision at the time to perceive that scene, and then have the robot be able to copy that scene. Uh, I'm going to move my head for a little bit. Uh, have a robot be able to copy that scene and reproduce a replica of that. Um, learning from demonstration has, has 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 moved on to mean other things, where we we also move the robot's arm and the ro and we can replay uh, the motion of the robot. Um, there's many different things that. Uh, that you know that we can try to teach the robot many different forms of it, but this is sort of the beginning, and this is sort of what we'd like to be able to do: have, be able to teach the robot, show the robot what we want to do, the same way we would with a human partner. And this is what we're what we're building up to, uh, in terms of learning from demonstration. 
uh, learning from demonstration is one of many different uh, different approaches uh, to programming robots. Um, you could use your traditional programming languages. You could use cognitive architectures. You could use uh, planning-based programming. There's many different ways uh, that you could do this, but we really want something that if we look at it in, with respect to these three axes, it has to be able to perform the task well. It has to be able to scale to new tasks uh, you know, uh, in a seamless way. And it has to have an ease of interaction that the, that that not everybody with a computer, everybody's going to have a computer science degree or an engineering degree. Uh, we want it has to be easy for other people to show the robot what to what to do, non non technical users. Um, and so I think learning from demonstration has the has a has a tremendous potential for this. But when we think about what the next generation of learning from demonstration should look like, um, this really starts to you know we want to move it along the axis of performance and scalability. And so there's a number of different um, there's a number of different domains that are coming together uh, to make this happen. So there's semantic mapping, which is building, being able to perceive the semantics of objects in a in, across three dimensional space. Uh, and if we can combine that 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 three dimensional perception of not just the geometry of space, but also the form and functions of objects in that space. Um, and be able to predict the, the causal outcomes, uh, then we could we could potentially use planning-based programming to then just show goals, and then uh, and then a planner can reason over all the actions and motions it needs to to achieve some outcome that we've that we've been able to perceive. Uh, and we and my group is putting this together in terms of the uh, the area of semantic robot programming. So in this case, what we're trying to do is have uh, is be able to just go up to a robot and show it. All right, robot, here's an arbitrary thing, uh, a goal that I wanted to show you, the robot should be able to perceive that uh, using a combination of uh, convolutional neural networks backed up by a probabilistic inference. Uh, and then it, it can remember that goal in terms of a, a, a scene graph or an axiomatic representation uh, that you could re re represent in something like the planning domain description library. Once that goal is represented uh, and memorized by the robot, if it comes up to an arbitrary scene, an arbitrary arrangement in the future, it could use those same perception mechanisms to then uh, represent this, uh, this current state of the world axiomatically uh, in a planning domain description li li library uh, uh, representation, which is effectively a scene graph. And then once, the, once we've re represented uh, both the current and the goal, we can then just use task and motion planning to uh, to to transit for the robot to then reason about how to transit the world from our current uh, from our current situation our current state into into the goal state. Um, and so uh, and so really this is this is uh, we're watching the robot do this uh, right now. Um, Sorry, uh, I just had a quick thing. Um, and so the robot is really, you know, in this case, what's, what's notable is that the robot is just doing everything on its own. The only thing we've shown the robot in this case is this is what I want the outcome to be. And everything else happens uh, happens autonomously. And this is where this is, and there are limitations to this, uh, but we should, but this gets to where we want to go, where the robot is doing things uh, on its own. And we're really just delegating tasks to it. Um, this is just showing uh, the our robot doing this uh, for each of the for each of the goals shown here in the upper left hand corner. The robot is is uh, reasoning over what need what it needs to do to achieve that goal. Um, this is really this was really uh, this is work that was published a few years ago, and you know it has some limitations to it. We're only just showing one demonstrated scene. How do we how do how does the robot learn uh, more and more over time, uh, and then uh, and then uh, and then update from multiple demonstrations? How do we get this to work with just beyond just pick and place actions? Um, and as and as uh, as um, as uh, as uh, Pratap mentioned. Uh, you know, how does this work when we can't see all the objects? You know, there's a whole building full of things that we might want to consider. Uh, you know, how do we have a, give robots a sense of object permanence so when it tries to complete a task, it can think about uh, it can think about um, it can reason about objects that are not in its current view. Um, and so that really is our is our is a lot of our challenges. I'm going to speed because I'm running a little bit behind time. I'm going to speed through the perception part of this, uh, but you know, but effectively. You know, in order for us to do semantic robot programming in this form, we've got to be able to perceive these objects, and so we have to be able to perceive the pose and 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 and, and scene graph of an object. We still assume object geometries, but we're relaxing that assumption. Uh, but we need to be able to perceive the world. Um, we all want to do this without green screens, without monocolor objects, and all the crutches that we use that that are limit that will limit the impact of of robotics working in situ. And we take a lot of inspiration from what we've seen with autonomous cars. 
Um, and so if you've, if you've seen the, the fabulous 3D maps that can be built, this is a, a video from my colleagues, Ryan Eustace and Ed, Ed Olson, who, were, who worked with uh, an autonomous vehicle project. This is, I think this video is from 2014. Uh, just shows you how long this has been around. We can build fabulous models of space uh, geometrically. So what you're seeing in blue is what the robot's built up. Uh, what you're seeing in red is what the, what the robot is seeing currently off of its laser range finding. So we can, so building out reasoning about geometry of space is something robots can do very well right now. Um, not perfect, but, but very well. Um, but what we, what we don't know is how can robots reason about the semantics of all of these objects around it? The points that belong to a tree need to be treated differently than the points that belong to, a, to a, an adjacent car or the bicyclist going through the intersection or a, or, or a building. These semantics are really important. And so, uh, so what we, if we can get the, if we can follow this, this successful pattern from autonomous navigation of being able to localize the, the robot probabilistically, because we have a lot of uncertainty and perception, then we can take an estimate off that. We can, we can decouple that and then symbolically do task and motion planning in order to, uh, in order to, to navigate to our goal, our goal, uh, our, to our objective. Um, similarly, we could do the same thing for manipulation, where if we can uh, localize the scene, we can take a good scene estimate. Uh, then we can uh, then we can use task and motion planning to then uh, to then um, update and and do and and reason. Even if we make a mistake, we've got probability math uh, so that we can We have alternate hypotheses. So. If we, if our perception is mistaken, we'll take actions and then recover. If, uh, if, 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 if we, if we had a bad estimate, given that we have that probability mass, um, and so really that scene estimation problem still remains a, a big issue, but we're making good headway into it. Um, and this is just one video that shows uh, shows some of the work that we've been doing. And so this is uh, this is my my, uh, my student Jeming here, who's just dumping objects onto the table. And uh, and by doing that, uh, the robot is trying to localize each of these, recognize and localize each of these objects. And um, great. Whoops. And so by doing that, the uh, the robot is uh, is sorting them into uh, into laundry objects and not laundry objects. Uh, and so part of the recognition. Uh, you should note that the robot just put the comet into the go into the laundry room bin. Uh, that, that is wrong uh, because comet goes in the kitchen. Uh, my, I think that's not a, you should note that's not an error of my students. Uh, that's an error of, uh, of, that's not an error of the robot. That's an error of my students because I think they just don't do a lot of laundry or dishes. Um, but that aside, uh, what the, what one thing that we, that we think is really important for this type of perception is that we want to use the best of neural networks. The neural networks can give us a, a good guess of what's 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 out there, and it can do that very quickly, which is which is good. But what neural networks can't do is is help us sort through which ones of those are false positive and which ones of those are false negatives. And so we've been using probabilistic inference either through particle filtering or belief propagation, non-parametric belief propagation, in order to um, in order to uh, to figure out, in order to to sort through which of these neural network uh, recognitions is is correct or not, and that really is where we're trying to go in terms in terms of bringing the best of discriminative neural network based inference together with the robustness and um, the robustness of uh, of probabil generative probabilistic inference. Which, you know, I'm going to make the argument that Bayesian inference is ready for a comeback in that regard. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna move on from from there and just say that we're that with semantic robot programming I've I've iterated a number of challenges here uh, that I've that we've I've talked about before. The one thing I would add to that is that uh, is that our world is dominated by transparency, transparent objects all over the place. Even my water bottle right here is transparent. Um, and so uh, and so how are we gonna have robots work with those? And so those types of transparent objects. We need, we'll, we'll have to have, uh, it causes a data efficient, inefficiency for neural networks. Um, it's, you know, it defeats RGBD sensing. And so I think light field cameras offer a, a good way for how, for how we can deal with those, these types of transparent objects. And so, uh, so really that's, you know, I think this is, this is how we could be programming robots or at least one possible avenue for the future. And that leads me to my, my last uh, question. Uh, the, the last question that I usually get, which is, can your robot bring me a drink? And, uh, and you know, and, you know, cause, cause we have all these capabilities. Can we do this? And, you know, and that, that actually is the easiest, these quest, easiest of these questions, because yes, uh, not only can our, our robot bring you a drink, uh, and 
oftentimes roboticists, when they say drink, they mean beer. Um, <laughs> I've been to, to enough Icarus to know this already. Um, but but sure, this is no problem. We can we can we can bring it. We can bring a drink. Um, and this is just a common demo that we do in robotics. You know, uh, we've done this many many times. Many groups have done this. Uh, you know, it really is. A, it's a fun thing to do. It's a good code sprint for getting for getting people um, acclimated in robotics. Um, and then when we show this off. A lot of times what people ask is, you know, if, you know, that looks really cool. It reminds me of this thing I saw on TV. Um, and increasingly over the past few years, it's been, you know, have you seen the, have you seen the show Silicon Valley? I saw a robot or I saw some technology on Silicon Valley. And, you know, is this like this? And that one, that kind of worries me a little bit because one thing that they say on, from, on Silicon Valley is, um, or the show on TV is, is they are, whatever they're working on, it will make the world a better place. Um, and, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I mean, I think that show gives you some some moral dilemmas that, you know, when they talk about tech ethics as tethics or anything like that. Right. Is is really what you're doing, make the world a better place. It could apply to anything. Um, you know, you could make the world a better place through constructing elegant code hierarchies for maximal code reuse and extensibility, making the world a better place. Uh, you could make the world a better place through scalable fault tolerant uh, data, distributed databases with acid transactions. That's making the world a better place. Um, the one that really gets me is, uh, is from the CEO of a fictional company called Hooli. Um, uh, and and the, the, it's, it's a big tech conglomerate. And the CEO of Hooli, uh, Gavin Dawson, uh, says Hooli is about making the world a better place through minimal message-oriented transport layers. This is in season one, episode one, right? And when I saw that, I was like, oh, because, um, because you know, because if you replace Hooli with Rossbridge, which is the protocol I talked about for robotics before, uh, then you know, then really this could just be me talking about this, and you know, and you know, am I really, you know, and am I sort of, you know, double dealing here and sort of saying I'm making the world a better place, but not actually, I'm just serving myself. I don't know. I think about this a lot. Is my world, is my work actually making the world a better place? Uh, am I really backing up? Uh, you know, am I walking the walk and talking the talk? You know, uh, it's hard to say. Um, and, you know, and a lot of this came, came, to, came forward uh, on, on Memorial Day last year. Um, it gave a lot of people some, some time to, you know, some, some uh, moments to reflect. Uh, you know, when you saw a man uh, lose his life um, just for trying to buy groceries, even with a, a counterfeit $20 bill, um, you know, this really, you know, I think we saw a lot of the inequities that we have. Uh, this, you know, that, that the world is not an equitable place for everybody. This is hard to watch, but it gave, you know, it gave us a, a lot to think about and a lot about how we can actually make the world a better place. Um, it inspired me and a number of my colleagues to write the Black and Computing uh, letter um, for, you know, to talk about how we can be more equitable uh, in computing with regard to how we behave as individuals, how we behave as, as, as communities and how we behave as organizations. Uh, what can we do to, to actually make the world a better place through the profession of computing? Um, and, you know, and as much as I, and this has been great, we just had our, our article just got published in the communications of ACM. And so you can read more about that. Things have progressed, things are getting better. Um, but when we think about the practice of artificial intelligence, to me, things got really real on January 9th, when we learned about the events of, of January 9th, uh, 2020, which was, uh, which was my 46th birthday. And while I was in Ann Arbor, uh, celebrating with my family and my friends and my students and my research group, um, you know, not far away in Farmington Hills, uh, which is, you know, not far from Ann Arbor, uh, Robert Williams was arrested purely off of a bad facial recognition hit. Um, and that, you know, and, and, and that was really troubling, uh, incredibly troubling. Robert Williams was a, 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 a store in Detroit got, got uh, was robbed. And that's uh, what you're seeing in the upper corner is footage from that. And somebody took that grainy video and ran it through a, uh, ran it through a, uh, what I'm assuming is a neural network for doing facial recognition. And out came Robert Williams as the, as the, as, as the, as the estimate. And that estimate was wrong. And so it was a false, you know, to my knowledge is the first automated false positive arrest by American law enforcement. 
And so he was arrested uh, in front of his family and his friends and his neighbors uh, and, you know, in front of his children. Um, the ACL, ACLU has an account of how he was detained for 30 hours. And, uh, and you know, I would, I'd recommend people read that. Um, and, you know, and, and Robert Williams wrote a fabulous uh, op-ed in the, in the Washington Post that says, you know, that talks about the dangers of using facial recognition. And Robert Williams isn't the only one. There's been more cases like this, Michael Oliver, probably many cases that we don't even know about um, that should give us a lot of pause, uh, not just as society, but also in, as, in the field of artificial intelligence about the impact of all of our inference systems that maybe people are overestimating what we're doing and we're hyping them up too much. Um, because if you can take, uh, if you can take, you know, a grainy image and, and, uh, and that comes up with, with, uh, with, you know, if you, and that started being used to affect people's real lives, uh, that can be a, a major problem and it can happen to anybody. So we had, if you take grainy images of president Obama and you run it through a neural network to do super resolution, depending on how you trained it, you can get a very wrong representation coming out. And you could make a case such as, uh, such as uh, Turing Award winner Jan LeCun, that this isn't a problem of computing, it's a problem of the data. And you know, the computing system is, is doing what it's supposed to do. And while technically that's correct, it is very irresponsible and wrong from my perspective because it gets to the systemic, uh, the systemic problems that we have in artificial intelligence. Um, that it's not just the system, you know, you can't just look at this individual system in the here and now, you have to look at who developed it, who's in the room making these decisions about what these systems can do and what they can't do. And if you look at it, it, you know, it looks, it looks like, you know, like your old Mad Men, uh, sort of Mad Men era, um, uh, you know, development team, you know, and so it's like, so this really is, you know, you know, you can't just sort of divorce the technical from, uh, from the larger systemic and social issues. And if you look at it in terms from a, a robotics perspective, uh, you know, deep learning has, you know, it used to be that motion, motion planning, path and motion planning and localization was by far away the most, to the, the most subscribed topic for, for papers at the, at, at major robotics venues. Um, that has been surpassed in, in recent years by, by deep learning by a lot. And so, we, so when I think about the robotic technologies of the future, I worry that we are overfitting to one particular viewpoint. And really it gets to, to how, you know, to, 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 to the, systemic, the, the systemic problems that we're dealing with in robotics in that if you have very few and marginalized uh, black AI researchers, uh, then you know, then you're not ha you're not you're having diversity in not just the in, in, you're not having diversity in both the research labs that are coming up with the ideas of the future, but you're also not the, those people that are that that uh, that come through higher education to get educated. They're not seeing black people teaching these classes and getting other perspectives that will be helpful because we because as faculty we both generate new ideas and we teach future generations. And that means that if we see few, if we have low production of black CS graduates, then, um, then, you know, then that inform that has a big influence on the technology and how it's produced uh, as it goes out. And then that technology can lead to, um, well, it can have uh, bad effects in, you know, um, uh, out in society where you could have uneducated or unwise use of AI technology. I don't know as much about this part, uh, what I would call the front end problem, which is how you deal with the technology once it's out there and think about how it's regulated and how, it's, how it goes out. There's great work in, uh, in, think, in the algorithmic fairness community. I would, I would uh, mention you know, the gender shades work by, by, um, by Timnit and Joy as, as, one, as one option. Uh, as somebody who, who's in higher education, uh, I think about what I call the back end problem a lot more. What's happening in the research labs, the diversity of the research labs, of the classrooms, and and who is being produced that'll go out and work in these spaces. And I would I would just direct you to our to the the Michigan Climate uh, Diversity and Climate Report, which has some very troubling numbers about what we're doing in higher education, uh, at least from the perspective of Michigan. Which, but I think it's it's representative of what we're seeing nationally. Um, I should also say that I took that picture from Viola Jones. I don't blame Viola Jones because if you go back and you look at their paper, you can see they said they clearly say we need diversity in facial recognition. Um, you know, this is really about the culture of AI in our computer science departments, and that, and you know, what we what we're what we're producing. This is a systemic problem. It really gets to how we incentivize and practice artificial intelligence. 
And so we've just failed to include black people in the advance of artificial intelligence. I mean, it really comes down to that. Um, if you look at, you know, historically, if you look at uh, of the fabulous book by Nils Nilsson, uh, who chronicles the origins of artificial intelligence, the people that have made an impact in artificial intelligence, the funding that has made it possible for artificial intelligence to get to this point, um, which is a fabulous book. I would really recommend people read this. Um, but the mixed response I have is that no Black researchers are cited. Basically, you know, according to Nils Nilsson, Black people just haven't had a role in, in artificial intelligence. Um, if you look at terms of the workplace, uh, you, you look in terms of the overall population, and then you look at, at who's represented in the overall labor force and rep represent with respect to the tech labor labor force, uh, you see vast disparities. Uh, not, we're not just talking about, uh, about um, African Americans, we're talking about, you know, disparate, what we call disparate impacts on many different demographics. Um, and I think these numbers are actually high. I think if you look at for women, it's probably 20 to 25%. Uh, for African Americans, probably closer to one to 3%, uh, not 7%, you know, um, for, uh, for, for, um, for, for people that are Hispanic or, or, or Latinx, you know, the, um, you know, that number is probably, probably, I, I mean, I'm guessing probably closer to 5%. And so these numbers, this is really bad. And this is what we call a disparate impact. There may not be uh, disparities in terms of who, in terms of the opportunity coming in, but there's something latent in the system that is producing these, these, this discrimination um, that, or, or, uh, or just ill effects that, uh, that leads to these bad outcomes. And we know that if you don't if you don't have diversity when this technology is produced, that is what leads to uh, to racism or other forms of discrimination in the in in the software in, in the software that's produced. And really, you know, these are sort of macro things. But if you want to think about how you can address it yourself in terms of being a better citizen, um, it really is understanding what drives our our our, our systems. Um, you know, if we want to get down to just the basic incentives of, of what's, uh, what's uh, what a faculty member faces, uh, what we do if we want to succeed, and this is maybe a bit cynical and a bit tongue in cheek, but, but I think there's a kernel of truth to it, that we, what we do is we create a bubble of success around, uh, a bubble around us that exudes success, right? We want to, we want to look good. We want to appear smart and, uh, and capable. We use that that uh, that presence to get uh, th and that pedigree to get our proposals funded and produce and produce results. We form alliances of people that think like us, and then we collude with those people to to promote the views of the alliance, and then also dismissing other viewpoints that uh, that you know that that we don't agree with. Um, and trying to marginalize those ideas. And then we use the patronage that we've built up to then place our people in academia and industry. And then we use that patronage to then get more funding and people and then repeat this cycle over and over and over. Um, and this really is, you know, this cycle that, that we're seeing for research is really no different than the criticism that we're seeing for law enforcement. Because if you replace research with, with law enforcement, you're really talking about the way that police unions use, the, police union, unions use this, the same strategy to avoid accountability. It's not that they don't have a hard job. It's not that they don't have, that, that we should not value what they do. Most of law enforcement is trying to do a good job and we should pay them more. We should respect them more. We should do more to help them do their jobs effectively. But there has to be accountability. The same way you would ask accountability of a commercial airline pilot um, or somebody else whose lives uh, are, are in your hands, you got to have that accountability or it doesn't work. Um, so what can you do? Um, just, you know, really, I enumerated these things in, uh, in some, some of my other talks. It, uh, it really is about uh, eliminating double standards. When you look around, are you, eat, are you consistent in how you treat the, your colleagues, your students, applicants to your program? When you look around your research lab or your citation list, your classroom, the committees that you serve on, are you, are you, are you seeing that, uh, that you're producing equitable outcomes? And, are, and if not, are there double standards that's, pre that's preventing that? And if you can do that, you can eliminate those double standards, you can eliminate these disparate impacts. Um, you know, it's something that we see in terms of your funding meeting. It's something that we see in terms of our curriculum and how we, and, and the, um, and the ways that, and our pathways through the, through, through these curricular programs. Um, I'm going to skip that. Uh, 
uh, I think in robotics, we're trying to we're trying to to eliminate some of these curricular issues uh, by first starting with linear algebra, because I believe uh, linear algebra should be the first math course more so than than calculus. If we and that allows us to, to start with the fun stuff first and get students the machine learning faster and doing slam faster. Uh, and we should provide better advising that helps students find their path in the robotics and AI. I know I'm going through this fast, but I'm behind time. Uh, and we should also incentivize equal, equal opportunity. Um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which has created a great environment that wants more, that has let more people come to our country and be a part of it, that has created more opportunities across many different, dem different demographics, basically says, if you're getting federal funds, you should make sure that you're, you don't have disparate impacts on your system. Uh, and so that applies to, to institutions that get financial student financial aid, uh, that applies to institutions that are getting research funding. And we know this has worked because Title IX uh, has made has you know the 20%, 20 percent, 20 to 25 percent we've seen for um, for women, for female participation in uh, in computing. It's that is it's not perfect, but it's better than what we had uh, before. And that is is largely that has a that has roots in Title IX of the Educational Amendments of 1972, which eliminated which uh, prohibited uh, gender disparities or ge opportunities based off of sex. Um, in our in in higher education. All right, skipping that joke. Um, so in a, in in the end, you just remember that that uh, if there's one thing that you take away from this talk, we need more empathy in computing. It really is important because our work has real consequences. And so when we're thinking about how we innovate and the excellence that drives us, that is why we wanted to be in this field to begin with. We have to balance that with equal with our commitment to equal opportunity. And if we can do that. And in order to really make the, make the make those two square, we've got to be able to have an economic incentive through our funding practices, through how we how we how we incentivize startups, through how we incentivize faculty to behave in in our programs, as well as what the the lessons that we give to our students. That really is what we can what we need in order to um in order to create the the computing environment, the robotics environment that's needed to create the society that we'll want in the future for our kids and generations to come. So with that, I would thank you very much. Uh, thanks for listening. Awesome, thanks a lot. I'm going to clap on behalf of everyone. Uh, <laughs> people are muted, so but, uh, thanks a lot. This was a very, very interesting talk and I'm sure the audience took a lot from the talk. Uh, so at this point, uh, we'll open up to the audience. Folks, if you have questions, uh, you can raise your hand or type it out and I can read it out. Uh, but uh, if, if you raise your hand, I can also unmute you. Uh, but I have a question to to, to kick things off. Uh, sure. I'm, I'm curious to sort of know the... So there's there's been... Uh, if you look at the computer vision community, if you look at the machine learning community, uh, there's... Uh, and and contrast that to robotics, I would say uh, like all areas have problems. Right, so all areas have uh, uh, need to take a look at uh, whether they are providing equitable access or not, and and clearly not. I think. Uh, but I see the CV community. I see the the fairness in AI community uh, sort of making concerted efforts towards addressing that problem. There's a way. There's a long way to go but there's at least initiatives that have come out in the last few years. Uh, but then if you look at the robotics community, I don't see any uh, concrete efforts, uh, sort of both in terms of the papers we write, the kinds of problems that we solve as in some sense consumers of uh, the machine learning uh, technology as, as uh, sort of someone who's using that technology and going to uh, apply that technology in a context that can directly affect people. Uh, I think that the robotics community sort of does need to to think about it, but I don't see uh, any concerted effort towards that. So, is there a reason why that's the case? Uh, sort of what what what's been your experience? Uh, right, I'm right. Curious um, to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So, I I would say first I would say that that you're seeing some efforts from the machine learning community and the computer vision community, but I worry that it's just you know add an ethics statement to the end of your paper, um, and you know and write something, and you know it's really just sort of like you know, some something extra that's thrown on, but but it doesn't really get to the heart of the of the systemic systemic issues. Um, you know, I think you know, I I I know that there's there's people that are studying fairness, but I don't think they. I think it's really thinking about you know you know um, 
what the what you know what it's what this is going to look like when it's out in society or put you know casting blame on somebody else you know it's 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 google's fault or it's the fault of some regulator um but i think we have to look inside of our own departments um when you're looking at your classroom you know do you see the you're looking at the future of 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 robotics you're you know that's that's you know that's where it is those are the people that are going to develop the future technologies develop the um develop the future you know um innovations and so you know we have to see that in the research labs in the classroom uh because you know whenever i'm buying a product i'm thinking or whenever i'm teaching in, in class here at michigan i know that michigan has lots of students that are going to go off and and um and work at, at companies and when i'm looking at technology I, i'm thinking you know when i'm buying a tv i'm like you know there's probably some some students from michigan that that uh that were part of making this technology uh we've needed to make a make sure that they understand how to test these systems and understand what security is and how to build good software um and so you know so i do agree that you have to have ethics statements and it would be great to see more of that in robotics but really it comes down to just the practices that we see the people that you're seeing on a daily basis that's the future um how do we how do we change that and i think with robotics so i say this as somebody who who's starting to get more involved with the robotics and automation society it's slow progress that's coming i really have tremendous respect for people like like uh, like ming lin like um, like Nancy Amato, Allison Okamura, um, I think Seth H Seth Hutchinson is is trying to to do great things in order to get the robotic society to to think about you know um, you know to address these issues, these really difficult problems that are that are very complicated, and really start to move the discussion forward so that we can uh, we can we can um, we can have uh, better outcomes in the future. Awesome, Th thanks a lot. Uh, there's a question about uh, telepresence robot. I think you mentioned that earlier, and, yeah. and the fact that telepresence robots have seen ups and downs uh, over the years. Uh, and so, sort of curious to know, uh, sort of why we see cycles in uh, telepresence robots, and is that a technology problem? Is that a business case problem? Uh, I. Uh... <laughs> Oh wow! I don't know how to I don't know how to answer that. I mean that that is really sort of like a um, that really is sort of like a, a, I think that is I don't know where to start because uh, because right now in this pandemic my brain is melting for the number of hours I'm on Zoom. It is really it's like it is uh, you know I I think just trying to say that remote work is going to be uh, is just going to be working on. Um, you know, is just going to be working on Zoom or, or Skype, uh, you know, and, uh, and and working with people. I don't think that's the case. There really has to be some remote presence. Um, I think the really, you know, a lot of people are asking themselves through this pandemic, how do I, you know, how, you know, they, I think you, we like some of the, some of the, the effects of working from home, but we know we need to be present. You're going to see more flexibility time where, where people are going to maybe work from home you know, one to three days a week and, and limit the amount of compute, uh, commute time. Um, you know, I think that's gonna lead to, to better, better effects for the environment and climate change. Um, but how do we do it? You know, how do we pr provide this sort of collaborative work environments that is a blend of remote and present people? Um, you know, if everybody's all remote, we can all do Zoom. Uh, but it gets fatiguing and we still haven't figured out how to do that the right way. If we're going to do all in person, well, that, you know, that has its downsides as we've seen before. If you want to do hybrid, how do we do that? I don't think we really know how to do this. I think telepresence robots, if done right, could offer a, a, a pathway to doing this. But the problem, the thing that's stopping us is that it hasn't really, you don't get a lot of research credit for doing this because it's seen as sort of like an implementation issue. Um, there's a big divide between the HRI community and, and the robotics community to really sort of think about how do we advance this both technically, dealing with uh, the issues of sound, video, movement, um, auto autonomy, you know, all of those issues. And that those are separate from the, the human factors issues of what is acceptable, what's the cognitive load. We really have to come together for this. Um, and, you know, and I think, you know, we have to have some funding to make this happen. It's hard to make a business case from a venture capital perspective 
the tele, telepresence robots are a good are a good bet for for a company. Um, but then it's also hard to get it funded by um, by one of the one of the government agencies. And so we need some combination. If we think historically, we need some combination of Vannevar Bush and Arthur Rock to come together and say, how do we how do we do this? And I think one of the big areas where this could make a big a huge difference is computer supported uh, collaborative work. Um, in office environments, but also helping our aging and disabled pe populations that need some sort of remote care as well. Um, so tele tele telehealth, tele telemedicine. Um, all right, I'm I'm going to stop because I because I think there's five more minutes of rant on that, uh, but I think I got it all out. Awesome. Now this is I I I like to hear the five minute five more minute rant <laughs> at some point. <laughs> all right, uh, we're a couple of minutes over, but uh, last call for questions. Uh, any any. Any more questions from the audience? I have a bunch of other questions, but we'll we'll do that offline. We'll do that Sorry. at some, some some point. Fair enough. Okay. Awesome. Looks like uh, that's it. So again, I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, our our speaker, Dr. Uh, Professor Chad Jenkins. Uh, it's an excellent talk. Uh, as I said, this will be this has been recorded, so it will be up on the MRC YouTube channel. Uh, the audience, we have uh, more talks lined up. For the next few weeks, so I'll send out uh, more information about the upcoming talks. Uh, hopefully, all of you have a good weekend. Stay safe wherever you are, and thanks a lot for attending. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you so much.